Good morning, everyone. Or I guess it's afternoon now. Uh, I'm Heidi Edwards Dunn with the New Hampshire Small Business Development Center. Um, and we're thrilled to have you here today. Um, we part are partnering with UNH Innovation, their foster program, and Heather Gordon, we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, to present this webinar today. Um, uh, one of our sessions on turning your innovation into a business. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, SBDC, as you may know, um, we do a couple things. We do education for business owners, which is um, this webinar is an example of that. And we have uh, no cost e-courses on our website, which we'd really encourage you to take a look at. And our main focus is um, business advising, one-on-one -on -one individualized specifically for your business. Um, and you can meet with a business owner at no charge um, anywhere in the state. Uh, uh, right now, we're still doing a lot on Zoom, but um, we're beginning to move back into um, in person here and there. Um, and uh, just so you know, we are um, an outreach program of the Paul College of UNH. And um, so UNH Innovation and we are actually based both at UNH. And um, uh, we also are funded through the US Small Business Administration and um, through the state, through their Business and Economic Affairs Department. We are excited to have you here and I'm gonna let Heather take it from here. Oh, I should say, I always forget this part. Um, we are happy to take um, questions. Uh, Ed Miles will be our presenter today and um, if you'd like to add questions into the chat, we can bring them up as they're appropriate, or, and, but we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to just keep adding your questions in and we'll, we'll collect them and, and get Ed to answer them all when, we, when, we, when he finishes talking. <laughs> Heather? Thanks, Heidi. Um, I'm Heather Gordon. I'm a part of the Foster Program Management Team here at UNH Innovation. September of last year, UNH won a grant from the Small Business Administration. That's part of their FAST program. FAST stands for Federal and State Technology Partnership Program. And the objective of the program is to increase the SBIR and STTR grants in the state. FOSTER is the unique FAST program that we've developed for New Hampshire. And it stands for Focused on SBIR, STTR, Teaching, Equity, and Results. It was originally a one-year grant, but we recently were notified that we received a second year of funding to continue FOSTER, so we're really excited about that. Um, FOSTER provides training and mentoring in the SBIR and STTR process um, to New Hampshire small businesses. Um, we also have a micro-grant program that could provide funds to connect you with an SBIR expert that will help walk you through that application process. Um, so that's just a little bit about the FOSTER program. You can reach out to me um, with further questions or upcoming training on that program. Um, so now we'll turn it over to Ed. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. As Heidi said, uh, I am Ed Miles, um, and I'll be presenting today. And what I'd like to do is um, just remind you, any questions you might have, certainly if you want to just jump in, ask a question, that's fine. Interrupt me. So it's sort of a monologue. I do not have slides. I'm gonna just kind of freely talk and share. I'll share a couple of images along the way, um, but rather than going groaning through a PowerPoint, I just think I'll just talk to you about uh, sales and how to bring your business uh, to uh, generating revenue. So um, what I'll do is talk a little bit about myself, my education, my work background, hopefully lend myself some credibility, uh, talk about uh, the concept of productization of your product or service. And I'll talk a lot about that. Um, discuss some basic sales concepts, um, and I'll share some examples, and hopefully, if we can be interactive, um, use the chat function. Uh, Heidi will kind of draw my attention to any um, questions that you might have in the chat, or if you're uh, comfortable, again, just come off mute, jump in, interrupt me. I will not take offense to that. Um, so uh, in addition to that, again, I hope it to be interactive. I will have some examples of my own. Um, and then at the end, uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion session. So I'll just kick it off with an intro to me. Uh, once again, Ed Miles, uh, went to University of New Hampshire in 1986. I lived in Christensen for people who are familiar with the campus. 
I ate at the Philbrook Downing Hall. I watched hockey games at Snively Arena way before the Winmore Center. Uh, they actually had an associate's degree back then. I got my associate's in applied business management. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in marketing, and I have an MBA with a concentration in quantitative analysis. Um, for much of my professional career, I was in fiber optic uh, telecommunications. Um, for anybody who uh, may be familiar with the undersea fiber optic cable factory in Newington, uh, at the time it was called Simplex when I was there, but now it's part of Tyco Submarine Systems. I was in development engineering. Um, I, I was a test engineer, worked on uh, work in that space. If anybody wants to jump in and talk about fiber optics, I'd love to talk about uh, wavelengths and things like that. But uh, I eventually found my way over into the marketing department. And I think uh, a lot of the product knowledge that I gained in development engineering and working on the shop floor uh, helped translate easily into working on RFP responses for both government and commercial um, bids. So um, somebody's chatting here. Uh, Again, Heidi, if you want to just draw my attention, any questions, that's perfectly fine. Um, I worked at Cabletron Systems, another big employer in the state of New Hampshire back in the late 90s. Uh, and once again, they're very big on product knowledge. And I bring that up because it's an important part of selling. I think uh, in order to have credibility, you have to have you have to be able to answer those questions. And, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But uh, at Cabletron, they sent me to Pease at the time. Their main campus was in Rochester, New Hampshire. They sent me down to Peace to their training facility for a month before I got to see the inside of my cubicle and just really trained me on uh, the networking industry and on their products. Um, after that, I moved into a, um, in the early 2000s, a venture funded uh, startup company in Andover, Massachusetts. It was called Quantum Bridge Communications. It was an equipment vendor. Um, the technology eventually became the uh, Verizon Fios fiber to the home product. So again, once once again, there in uh, this technology space. Um, and then let's see, okay, currently I have three jobs. So here's my current job. First job, uh, I work uh, as a business advisor in the Seacoast region for the Small Business Development Center. And I'm here in that capacity speaking to you folks today, Heidi's clapping. I'm also the vice president of business, and de business development and strategy for a, a print shop here in Southern New Hampshire. I kind of jumped industries but uh, I, I moved it over to a print shop. We were three people back in 2002. And today we are uh, 70 plus employees. Pre-COVID, we were around 100, but we had some cutbacks. And uh, really, um, I have a lot of uh, experience and I'll talk, I use the print shop as, as an example and I'll use the startup company as an example um, as we move through some of these topics, but um, really just kind of help with the whole strategic plan for that print shop. My third job is I am an instructor at the Paul College at the University of New Hampshire. I'll be in Durham tonight, speaking to you in my home, from my home in Stratford right now, but I'll be on campus tonight teaching a course called Productization and Market Segmentation. Um, so I'm also an adjunct uh, instructor over at the Paul College. The other course I teach is called Business Development and Strategic Sales. And what I'm about to do is try to compress those two courses that I teach, Productization and Market Segmentation, business development and strategic sales into a 30 minute um, discussion uh, with you here this, uh, this afternoon. So, um, and I just want to maybe by electronic or physical show of hands for those who are comfortable coming off a video so I can understand the audience or maybe just put it in the chat. Um, if you've already uh, launched your company, raise your hand or just say already launched in the chat. Um, if you're a grant recipient or an SBIR, STTR uh, grant applicant or recipient, maybe just put that in the chat or raise your hand. I don't see any hands yet, but you can electronically raise with the reaction um, on Zoom. Um, and I'm just curious about uh, the stage you're at. If you're developing a product or service, do you have paying customers? Do you have non-paying beta customers? Regardless of the stage that you're at as a company, I just want to kind of tailor some of um, the conversation towards um, the diverse group. If you want to come off mute and just shout it out, say where you're at. Anybody? I'll give you maybe one minute for uh, helping set the stage for who the group is. Presently in business, development stage. Presently in business, development stage. Okay. So we got a, um, a variety here. Uh, no company. 
type stage, starting company, some paying, some non-paying data. All right, great. So I, I think I've accurately understood who the audience is uh, and the materials that I've created. What I'd like to do is I'm gonna share my whiteboard function. Um, so I, again, development phase with prototype, excellent. Um, and on the whiteboard, I will go to, let's see the text function or change the color of my text to maybe something nicer. Um, okay, so first I'm gonna talk about product and um, I'll give this this very simple example. So when I jumped out of technology and I jumped into the um, the print shop, we had these two 60 inch wide plotters. We're working out of about a thousand square feet of space. Um, the owner of the company uh, hired me. I was employee number one, and he just said, "I'd like to focus on hockey." So these, this print equipment, uh, we could walk down Main Street USA, sell banners, sell stickers to the pizza shop, the nail salon. You know, we could, we could have done that as a strategy, but the owner said hockey. So what we did was, um, or what I was chartered with, was creating a strategy around that. So rather than um, taking this print equipment and, and trying to be everything to everyone, we said, we're going to productize this. So we... Um, we did some research. We, we figured out that the, the hockey uh, market consumes this thing called a dasher graphic. So if you look at a hockey board uh, where all the advertisers are, if you're watching a Boston Bruins game and you see Dunkin' Donuts on the boards in front of the bench, that's called the dasher graphic. Um, well, as it turns out, it's a, it's a very uh, hostile sort of environment to put up a sticker. And uh, we had to do some R&D. So we created a relationship with a company that would work with us on development. And we developed a sticker where, first of all, our printers could not use aqueous-based inks. So you don't want water-based inks in that environment. And you also don't want an aqueous-based adhesive. So we use solvent-based inks and we use an acrylic-based adhesive. And then you want the board, you want to be able to stick to that, to those boards. So we developed this product. And I know this could be low-tech for some of the folks on this in this meeting, but it's a good example of productization. We took this manufacturing capability didn't become everything to everyone, but developed this product with an acrylic adhesive with a, um, a with a non-aqueous base tank, a solvent based tank. We, we worked on the grams per square inch of acrylic adhesive on the back of that sticker so that it would adhere to the boards. But when you went to peel it off, you could peel it off. It wasn't stuck there forever. It didn't come off in small slivers, which was some of the, the uh, stages we went through in developing it. Um, and we, we created this product. We call it the Dasher Graphic. Um, so we developed this dasher graphic, and then that's the productization of that particular manufacturing capability that was printing. So what that allowed it to do, what it allowed us to do was now give it a name. So we said, we're going to call that the dash max dasher graphic, and we're going to create tiers. We're going to say we have a, we have an ultra, which was actually just a five millimeter laminate, uh, over laminate. And we're going to have the pro, which was, uh, the, um, three millimeter over laminate. They were almost the same exact cost, but we just did a variation of cost. So we created these tiers of our product. So what it gave, when we gave it a name, when we developed it for the R and D, um, we gave it a name, we created levels of, of the product, the pro and the ultra, the ultra was the top of the line, five mil, mil, mils of, uh, of over laminate. It allowed us to become, uh, to be able to focus our energies and to go to a market which is the next topic I'd like to talk about, which is market, or the next uh, point I'll make is market. I'm gonna talk about market segmentation and the importance of that. So productizing the process, whether it's whether you have a, um, a service or a product oriented business is very important because you, you're an expert in what you do. You know, you have your wisdom, you have your knowledge base. I'm assuming there's a lot of engineers uh, that I'm speaking to right now. And the, the language that you use might not translate to somebody who could be a potential customer. And you probably have experienced that. So um, productizing it and giving it a name allows you that ability to put it into sort of a layperson's term and have it be more understood. So I've, um, again, whether it's a service, I, when I do my business advising job, I, I work with um, consultants and service providers who don't necessarily have a tangible product but they, they productize their, their service offerings, like offering package one, 
package two, package three. And then they're able to navigate, uh, they, can, they can say what's included in these service packages and, and can navigate the potential customers into one of those packages. So, and I think hopefully as I talk about these different examples along the way, you can just say, oh, that's why I haven't been able to um, maybe get past this first conversation with somebody because they don't understand what, I've, what I'm actually selling. Um, so I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but um, as I talk through these examples, just think about your product or your service and how you might give it a name and, uh, and make it something that, uh, I, I don't like to use the buzz term elevator pitch, but I'll use it. You, you'll have your elevator pitch for what it is. It allows you to effectively communicate to a lay person. So I'm reading from my notes, notes a little bit. And especially if it's a tricky technology to explain. Um, I'll give you a quick example. So at Quantum Bridge Communications, this uh, startup company that I worked at, we had a, um, we had a switch uh, that sat in the central office, a telecommunication provider, and we had a NID or a network interface device that sat on the side of somebody's home at a residence. So um, it's a lot of technology that goes behind that. And we had patents and everything that made us uh, be able to, to get some market share. But when we're explaining it to customers, we basically said to them, we create a bandwidth pipe to resident to residential users for um, for their for their bandwidth needs. So uh, basically, uh, that's the elevator pitch. So people can understand that. We didn't talk about all the other stuff, uh, all the magic that was behind the smoke and mirrors that made it work. But the the elevator pitch for that was um, that we work with telecommunication providers. They're our customers. We have a switch that sits in the central office. We have a, a network interface device that sits on the side of a person's home. And it's a, uh, a creates a large bandwidth pipe. And the problem with that is, and maybe some of you have experienced this, um, that was in the year 2000. There was no Zoom, no Pandora, no Netflix, uh, no Hulu. Nothing was driving, uh, nothing was demanding the amount of bandwidth that we created. Um, that company was eventually acquired by Motorola and again became the Verizon Fios product. But um, in that case, um, we didn't have the application drive, we didn't have the demand uh, for the application that we had created. So we're kind of ahead of our time there, but that's a little bit beside the point. Um, okay, now I'll talk about market segmentation. It's pretty self-explanatory. Market segmentation um, is just that. Uh, identifying your target market, who your dream customer is, and understanding who that is will allow you to focus your energies on speaking to them. And the only other point I'll make about this very obvious market segmentation without giving you a definition of it because it's self-defining is know who you are targeting, but also decide who you're not targeting. And uh, that's an important thing. So try, try to avoid being everything to everyone. Um, jumping back to the print shop just for a moment. Uh, so we knew in the beginning that we were developing this product that would be utilized in uh, college uh, facilities uh, and in minor pro hockey. It was super sticky, was used in those environments. We knew those were the target market. That was how we segmented the market. We also knew that we did not want to go to the NHL. We didn't want the Boston Bruins. We didn't want those NHL teams because the product that they use gets switched out after every couple few home games that they play. It didn't have the, the properties of the one that we created it was designed to last for the entire season. So the only point that I'll make that's maybe not as obvious is when you segment your market, you should know and the people that you work with should know, you should all agree on this, who you do not focus on. So trying not to be everything to everyone is, is actually really important. And maybe I'll just pause for a moment. I don't know if anybody wants to chime in or ask a question, I have a sip of water. Okay. The next thing I'll talk about is product knowledge. And the good thing about all this stuff is um, if, for example, you are a person who doesn't like, who cringes at the thought of selling, to actually having that conversation with somebody about positioning and your product and closing the deal, a lot of those concepts that I'm talking about can be worked on leading up to that 
actual uh, sales transaction or that interaction that occurs when you're selling. So whether it is you yourself or, or somebody on your behalf presenting um, your, your product or service offering, uh, the good thing is a lot of this work can be done uh, prior to the actual interface with a customer. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, and the, I, I'm making this point as I'm talking about product knowledge is it's extremely important to educate yourself on what you're selling and those who are representing what you'll be selling because that just lends itself to credibility. Um, you wanna kind of become the known expert at the, at the print shop. Uh, we became known as a, a nationwide sports signage expert. Eventually, that didn't happen overnight but the eventuality of us having the product knowledge and equipping our salespeople with the product knowledge to be able to have a conversation with, with a potential customer and help them navigate what their needs were um, related to what we had to offer. Uh, product knowledge is just key. And that's why Cabletron sent me the P's uh, trade for it for a month before they showed me the inside of a cubicle because they said, okay, you worked it you know, it's Tyco Submarine Systems, you worked uh, at this other company, you, you have a little bit of knowledge, but we really want to educate you on our products. So when somebody asks you a question and you respond, you want, we want you to respond in such a way that you show that, you, that we have credibility in, in uh, who our potential customers are talking to. Can't stress enough the importance of the people representing your products having, having product knowledge. And if it's yourself, making sure you can translate that product knowledge into that um, layperson's kind of uh, terminology and language. Um, the next thing that I'll say, and I said that it didn't happen overnight, that we became uh, known as a nationwide uh, sports signage uh, go-to company. Uh, a lot of what we used uh, to get that was trust signals. And um, within your industry, you'll know what they are. At, uh, at Quantum Bridge, we, we met IEEE standards, for example, you know, the, the IEEE standards that were related to our industry. Um, at the print shop, so just think about, uh, I'll just pause for a moment and just say, as it relates to your business, think about uh, industry affiliations or relationships that are points of credibility that you could become involved with. And being able to either meet uh, um, an engineering standard or uh, just be part of um, an industry affiliation. Uh, maybe there's a trade event that occurs within your specific industry that you could become part of, uh, whether it's virtually or in person. If people are meeting in person, you could um, offer to guest speak at a trade event uh, related within your industry. These are all pieces of the sales process or bringing your idea to becoming a business that, are, that aren't you know, immediate contributors to revenue, but they can lead to a path of you being recognized as an industry expert within uh, your space. So um, let's see, so trust signals. Um, again, the, uh, I think it's kind of obvious, uh, but I'll just kind of say it, the things that we did at the print shop where we became the official signage supplier to the American Hockey League. We created a relationship at the top level of what was minor pro feeding into the NHL. And by doing that, it gave us the credibility to go team by team and say, we're the official signage supplier to the American Hockey League. Manchester Monarchs, would you like to work with us? And they didn't give us, it gave us sort of this point of credibility, a trust signal. So again, as it relates to your uh, product or service, Think about, um, that's kind of a top-down sales approach that going, uh, becoming active within uh, your, your industry with uh, a trade affiliation, and then just really utilizing that trade affiliation to lend credibility to your product or service and utilizing that to, uh, as a go-to-market strategy. Um, so trust signals. The next thing I wanna talk about is, uh, can everybody see the whiteboard? Maybe just nod your head. I want to make sure the oh, white. Okay, yep. Thank you. Um, so, defining the sales process. So, I'll just I'll just kind of say this as um, 
I'm going to share. I'm going to share a different um, part of my screen now. So let me see how I can stop share this, and I want to start sharing this. Uh, where did it go? Sales process is an image. Give me one moment. So can people see the slide that uh, says sales process examples on it? Yes, thank you, Heather. So um, I show this slide not so you can jot it down or, or you know uh, try to memorize it, but the reason I want to show you this is that there's a four-step sales process, there's a five-step sales process, there's a seven-step sales process, and uh, I think it's I think you know you know for your product what the sales process is. If you don't, you should define and map it. So you should really write down um, what your sales process is. Um, for Quantum Bridge, for the equipment vendor that I worked at, we'd identified a telecommunication provider that we would have as our target. We would um, open a line of communication with them. We would understand what their needs were. Um, we would then tailor our equipment to their needs. We would deploy an evaluation unit into a central office. We'd find a beta site. Um, and eventually, after a period of time, uh, we'd troubleshoot, we'd add features. Um, if anybody's in the software industry, you know that it's not a bug until somebody complains. It's a feature until somebody complains, then it becomes a bug. So we would we'd work out the bugs and then we would convert that evaluation unit to revenue. So that was that's the that's me explaining the sales process and as an equipment vendor. Um, so I guess I wanted to show that slide real quickly just to kind of make a point that there's no one sales process that applies to any one industry. So just spend some time defining what your what the customer journey is from the initial interaction. I don't do marketing. I'm not, I do it. I mean, I have an undergrad in marketing, but marketing is that lead attraction. So that what I'm talking to you about this morning is what do you do once you get that lead? And, um, that's the journey that you should be able, you should define and spend time defining. You should know it. The people communicating with your potential customers should know it because they want to be told the journey that you're bringing them on. That's, that, that's not the customer's job. That's you saying, here's how it works. If you're going to work with us and I'm going to you know, work with you into the future as a paying customer, I should, def I should tell you what that is. Um, that journey is gonna be and what it looks like in working with us. Here are the steps. So spend some time defining your sales process and make sure that you know what it is and the people that are responsible for communicating with customers know what it is so that when somebody says, uh, hey Ed, how do, how do I purchase that from you? How do I purchase your product or service? You have the ability to bring them on that journey and eventually uh, convert them into uh, a paying customer. Um, okay. So the next thing I was going to talk about is go back to my uh, text whiteboards back up here and jump into this text box. Maybe I can't. I'll just start a new one. Okay, I'll start a new text box. Is um, predicting uh, objections and questions. So predicting objections and predicting questions. So uh, once again, no matter what stage you're at, whether you've already launched your product or not, uh, developmental stage, beta stage, whatever you're at, uh, being able to, um, there's a basic uh, sales premise, and I'm just gonna write this kind of underneath here. I'll tab in a little bit. I think that sales is, <laughs> Uh, setting expectations and overcoming objections. So when I, uh, when you think about your product or service, you should be able to say to yourself, um, what is an objection that somebody might ask me? And, uh, and how do I overcome that objection? And what is a, um, what is a question that somebody might have? And how do I answer that question? Equip yourself with that information, equip the people who are responsible for presenting your product or service with that information. Here are the basic ones. 
here's the here's the three top basic uh, typical objections: quality, price, and turnaround time. So you should, at a minimum, be equipped to answer the question about the quality of your product, the price of your product, and the turnaround time. Those are the three that are going to come up most frequently. Um, so be prepared to answer those, but also try to predict, uh, do some internal brainstorming or role playing within your company or with yourself or with your peers, and just try to predict what an objection might be. It'll lend itself to more credibility when you're in a situation where, you're, where you have the opportunity with a potential customer. Um, so again, predicting and overcoming objections is, is a big part of the sales process. Hopefully this information is good for you guys. I have a slide on overcoming objections. I guess I'll just share that for a quick moment. I'm trying to use my uh, all my Zoom skills here. So here's a, here's a tree that is um, a basic uh, overcoming objections tree. And uh, I love these flow charts. Um, what is the objection? Uh, and this is just, these are just examples. Contract with an, another company, cost, fear of change, required features, timing, so there's turnaround time. And just those are some really basic ones, but uh, I like to create a tree that would actually say, okay, if I'm calling on a potential customer for my product or service and their objection is, I just signed a contract with another company, I would, I would say, fantastic. I'm glad that you found uh, a company that you believe met, met your needs. What I would like to do is stay in touch with you and know that since you just signed the contract, I'm not going to try to get you out of the contract. But since you just signed that contract, you mind if I check back in a month and see how things are going? And so that's a, you know, this is, that's the never take no kind of approach to an objection. Just saying you don't uh, work hard to have marketing bring you a lead and have that lead tell you, I just signed a contract. You say, okay, thank you. Bye. And hang up or, you know, whatever the email exchange is. You should always be prepared to overcome an objection that continues to move people into the part of the sales cycle. Um, that we talked about, wherever wherever the, the people might be in that sales cycle, um, wherever the potential customer might be, you wanna meet them there. If they just signed a contract, excellent. So was it a one-year contract or a three-year contract? It's a one-year contract. And uh, okay, do that, great. I'd like to check back with it in, you with a, in a month if that's okay with you to see how things are going. Maybe you make a decision that it was a, not a great decision or I'm going to set a reminder to check back in in 12 months with them. And I'd like to see if I could have an opportunity to bid for your business uh, when, your, when your contract expires. Um, I'm just going to back up for one second because I'm not sure if I, I um, made a point about the sales cycle that I wanted to point out. Um, when you define what your sales cycle is and you know you map what that process is of your sales cycle, what you need to understand is sometimes, uh, when I talked about this contract, it reminded me, potential customers could show up at anywhere in that cycle. So if you map out a five-step or a seven-step sales cycle, you need to understand that somebody might have done uh, a lot of research already. They could be showing up at uh, step number five of the sales cycle, which is ready to make a purchase decision. So understanding where they are in the sales cycle is important. And the other point I wanted to make, if I could back up for one moment on sales cycle, is um, the last step of the sales cycle, if people are taking notes, for everybody should be, how do I keep that customer into the future? How do I bring them back to step number one of the sales cycle and either get them to renew a contract or provide them uh, another release or uh, bring them new features and benefits or a service contract that would create incremental revenue with me. So how do I create an annuity out of that customer that I got all the way to the point where they closed the deal? That shouldn't be the end of the process of you working with a customer. It should be, be the beginning of a relationship that you create into the future. So when you map out your sales cycle, last step, whether it's five, six, seven step process should be, how do I bring them back through that process and continue um, working with that customer into the future? So let's see if I want to go back to my whiteboard if I have another fun slide to share. Um, 
oh, I wanted to talk about uh, this and I did not bring it up. So um, I wanna talk about features and benefits now. So let me just, I'll go back to my whiteboard for a moment. Anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to add? Hopefully this is helpful information for folks. I'm gonna do a time check, we're at 12.38. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about a formula. And again, assuming there's a lot of engineers, this is an important formula, important formula. It's really easy to remember formula, if I can spell it. Uh, features plus benefits equal value. I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes. Um, so when you think about your product or service, no matter where you are in the stage of your company, already revenue generating, already 100 employees or just uh, developing it, you should really think about your features of your product or service the benefits of those products or service, because if you can justify with a benefit of each feature, you can create value, and then it justifies the price that you're gonna charge for your product. And I'll give you a quick example here. Here's a list of features for the switch from Quantum Bridge that sat, sat in the central office. At the time, uh, we used an ATM backplane. It was uh, a asynchronous, asynchronous, can't say the word, transfer mode. It was not ethernet but it was a 25 gigabit ATM backplane. It had, uh, that switch had hot swappable blades. It, had a dedica it was a dedicated access medium, so not shared, it was a dedicated access medium, and it had field programmable data rate uh, uh, chips, FPGAs. So maybe some people know what I'm talking about if you're within the industry. But now I'm gonna, so I'm gonna list those features again. So here's feature, feature, feature for the Quantum Bridge QB5000, that's what we called it. That's the product name, had a snazzy name, QB5000. So 25 gigabit ATM backplane, hot swappable blades, dedicated access medium, FPGA chips. If I just say that, it doesn't mean anything. Those are, that's a feature list, so that's feature, feature, feature. Now I'm gonna change that up. I'm gonna do a feature plus a benefit, and let's see if there's some value that starts to translate here. It had a 25 gigabit ATM backplane, it, so that backplane was uh, a, a backplane that allowed it to be a stable operating system, unlike Ethernet at the time. Ethernet's a lot better now. It had swap, hot swappable blades, so that if there was a problem in the central office, you could remove one blade from the switch without having to shut the whole thing down and not disrupting all the other blades within the switch. So, and you could change out uh, one of the blades within that switch and maintain network integrity. So that's the benefit. It was a dedicated access medium. So that's just a feature. The benefit was not a shared access medium like cable, where at the end of the day and everybody in your neighborhood's home and running their, their TVs and everything watching or on their computers. It's a dedicated access medium. It was fiber direct to your home, it was a direct pipe. It didn't get, it didn't get bogged down as a shared access medium like cable does. And it used field programmable Gatorade chips, not risk-based chips, which are hard-coded, but field programmable Gatorades, gate arrays, so FPGAs. So when we needed to do an upgrade, we could do that upgrade in the field, basically, without having to change out uh, big components on the switch. We could reprogram new releases into the switch without having to change out hardware. So FPGA, tip, FPGA chips, with that benefit of being able to upgrade them in the field. So um, I kind of stumbled through that because it's been 20 years since I talked about those switches, but uh, rather than just listing feature, 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 when you do feature plus benefit equals value, I'm gonna show you what I was attempting to accomplish here uh, by sharing my next screen. And I didn't make this uh, slide, but I'll show you this slide. When you, can, when you can increase the value, when you can put more weight on the value, you're, better, you're able to better justify the price. So the price can be higher. So if you just list feature, 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 and don't do feature plus a benefit, then the value equation is not as easy to translate. I'm not saying it's impossible, but when you have marketing collateral, or general, um, the people who are speaking to potential customers, positioning your product or service, 
make sure that they just don't rattle off a bunch of features, especially if they're techie kind of features. Make sure every feature has a benefit associated with it and you'll equal value. Feature plus benefits equal value. The more value, the better you can justify, justify the price that you charge. So features plus benefits equal value is the point that I'm trying to make there. Let me go back to my whiteboard. Okay, so I'm very close to the end here. I was supposed to talk 30 minutes. I think I'm coming up on 30 minutes. Um, okay, last point that I'm gonna make and then we can kind of open it up to discussion. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear if anybody would like to share um, how any of these concepts might've been employed at their um, business or if they're considering it, I'd love to hear people talk about it. So the last point that I'll make is selling is relationship building. And this makes it a lot less scary. Um, so the importance of this point is when you, if you're the representative or the person representing you, your, your product or service gets through to a customer, and this is just a, a stylistic thing, everybody will come up with their own style. I'm big on scripts. It's a telephone, I have a phone script. I don't read from it, but I, I reference it like I've been looking at my notes here and it helps me to collect my thoughts. But when I get somebody on the phone, I don't start rattling off my features and benefits. Oh, Heidi, thanks for answering the phone. Here's the features and benefits of my product. I say, hey, Heidi, you're, you're working at this telecommunications provider that I'm targeting and hoping to sell to. How long have you been there? And then I just, so this is relationship. This is, and again, it's all a matter of technique and, and your own style, but I'd ask Heidi how long she'd been working there. And I'd say, oh, great, where did you go to school for that? Oh, you went to Wentworth Institute? My son-in-law went to Wentworth Institute. That's pretty cool. How did you get into the telecom industry? So, and, and it's, I'm not trying to be disingenuous, but I'm trying to create a relationship with Heidi before I rattle off features and benefits of my product or service. So, and, and I think, again, stylistically, um, I just like to make this broad statement because I've been in sales and business development my, my whole professional career at each company that I've worked at, I've eventually found my way into that role. And I think that it's important to remember that it's just really about creating a relationship and truly defining if, um, if you found your way to the potential customer that could utilize the product or service that you're offering. You don't want to cram something into uh, a customer, you know, make them buy something that they don't need. Um, but really, uh, the last point I wanted to make is selling is really just about relationship building. And um, it's all it really comes down to. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and um, hope to see you at the end of October. Um, and thank you, Ed. We, you did a great job. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a great day. Bye.